Welcome to You Today. I'm Paul Peppis, director of the Oregon Humanities Center. My guest today is writer Betsy Bonner. She is a visiting assistant professor in the creative writing program at the University of Oregon. Bonner is the former director of the 92nd Street Y Unterberg Poetry Center in New York City and has taught at the Writers' Foundry MFA program at St. Joseph's College in Brooklyn. She has also been a member of Penn's prison writing program. Bonner is the author of the poetry collection Round Lake from 2016 and the memoir The Book of Atlantis Black, The Search for a Sister Gone Missing, an NPR Best Book of 2020. Bonner's poems have appeared in the Hopkins Review, the New Republic, the Paris Review, Poetry Daily, the Southampton Review, and others. Her nonfiction has been published in Harper's Magazine, the Cortland Review, and the New York Times Book Review. On November 2nd, 2022, she gave a reading as part of the UO's Creative Writing Program Reading Series. Thanks, Betsy, for coming on the show. It's great to have you with us. Thank you, Paul. It's an honor to be here and to meet you. So first, tell us a little bit about your background and how you wound up being a writer. <sighs> I fell in love with poetry around age eight. I think a lot of nursery rhymes were my first uh, poems. In high school, Sylvia Plath and Anne Sexton were my gateway poets. And I had an amazing, there was a teacher, Christopher Castellani, who's a novelist. He was visiting my high school for one year and he gave me those books. Um, and Emily Dickinson, I couldn't understand in high school, but then I had really good teachers in college. Marie Howe is the other answer to that question. She was my Don, which is an advisor at Sarah Lawrence, and she told me about Columbia's program and living in New York City. I then met many, many, many writers in the community. So let's talk about the volume of verse that you have in front of you, Round Lake. First, tell us about the title. What is, where is, what is Round Lake? Oh, Round Lake, it's several things. It actually goes back to Marie Howe again. Um, there's kind of an amazing story where someone who died left her her house without telling her in advance. And it's in this area um, in New York that's kind of magical and there is a round lake there. There's also Round Lake near Saratoga Springs, which is a, if you go there, you'll see these little lanterns, like a, these houses all clustered together. Um, so it's a couple of places in New York. Would you read us a poem? I would love to, thank you. Sunken Table. The last time I saw white blossoms, I put one petal on my tongue, stuck it to the roof of my mouth, and pushed my stocking foot up the leg of your jeans. But now, when I kiss your hand, and your warm, dry fingers fill me, and your ring leaves fitful traces, this snow is dancing on a lake where everybody drowns. Do you want to say anything about that poem in particular? <laughs> Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. So the volume, Round Lake, is in many ways, um, and in many poems, an elegiac volume. Yeah. There are elegies for your sister, for your mother, and for your father. First, how do you understand the importance and the work of elegy? Why is elegy an important poetic genre? Oh, goodness. Well, I did, some of these poems are set in Greece, and I lived in Greece, and I taught poetry in Greece. That was my first poetry teaching job. Um, I'm attracted to Sappho. I'm attracted to what I know about those hexameters. I'm not a scholar in that form. Um, contemporary elegies have always appealed to me. I like sad poetry. <laughs> I like humor, too, but I, I, I I do use poems, I turn to them for comfort, in addition to craft and art and all that. So you've just mentioned your love of Sappho and the yeah. Hexameter. So the volume is filled with a, a variety of different poetic forms, and in some cases you're actually trying to translate into English some of those, uh, those Greek forms. So tell us a little bit about how you understand the relationship of poetic form to poetic content. How do you approach those when you write? I mean, I think the most fascinating thing we can do is find a form for the poem. So at our best, we enact through the form, we enact the meaning. And the whole goal, one of the goals is to, to create emotion in the reader. And we can do that subtly. Um, I find, you know, the poem 
sometimes I have to write many, many, many drafts. Sometimes I have to write very long lines and do, you know. Most of these, most of these, if they're not sonnet length, they turned into um, sort of long, slender, a lot of white space, uh, which also, it's funny, you know, the hexameter can seem like it would be so long, um, but sort of dripping, I, I feel like some of this really was sort of the forms were dripping down. Talk a little bit about the visual aspect of, of poetic form. I mean, you've talked about it just now as, as something that's visual as well as oral. Say a little bit about what, how you understand the, the visual component of poetry. Well, I think one thing that distinguishes a poem from not being a poem, typically, and this has, it can change, but it is the line. So we start with the line, we have the line break, we have enjambment, and we have stanzas. Um, I think it comes down to the line, otherwise it begins to seem like prose, though in contemporary American poetry we have a lot of genre blurring. Um, Lucy Brock Broido, who was one of my teachers at Columbia, also Richard Howard, uh, they were very hands-on with editing and teaching us editing. With Richard, we would go to his apartment in New York, feed his dogs some treats, and he would sit and edit. And once I cried <laughs> in his apartment, and he was my first publisher. He published me in the Paris Review. But there was a time when I, I brought him brand new work, and he said, bring me your finished work. Um, anyway, I learned editing from him, from Lucy, and first of all, from Marie. But I think your question was a little bit different. Your question. About the visual appearance of yeah, the poetry, visual the appearance. visual component of poems. I mean, I do like poems that look like poems, so mm -hmm. I like poems that have line breaks, typically. So would you read us another one? I'd love to. I'm going to read you my favorite one, which is the last one. Stopping on Delos, I climb a hill to the temple of Isis. Her missing face looks out to sea. All her dreams are nautical. Poppies enfold her granite pedestal. A bump, a burr, a barnacle, flecked with red paint, clings to her waist. Stub thumb of an ancient child, pagan mother, take my hand, tiny, unsculpted, living. So you mentioned that you lived and taught in Greece, and obviously that poem and other poems show the influence. So say a little bit more about what, how being in Greece, that time you spent in Greece, affected you as a poet. I had a friend in common who introduced me to A.E. Stallings, which was absolutely thrilling in Athens. Are you acquainted with her? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, let's see. I had time. I've had what felt like time for the first time since really entering school. Um, my job at the 92Y absolutely thrilled me, but it's true that New York City, for a writer, if you don't take time, you know, you have to find a residency, you have to find, you know, some kind of vacation. So this was a whole, you know, it was nine months, um, really, I guess, two different, sick, yeah, yeah, two different semesters. You had to leave. Um, legally, you couldn't just stay, you know. Mm -hmm. So I had a house in the mountains. Um, I could see the Aegean Sea. And yes, I had responsibilities. I had, I was actually doing my class. Um, we listened to a lot of poetry. I had recordings from the Y, from their audio archive. And my, another teacher I'll mention, Marie Ponceau, she used to run workshops without paper. You know, we read everything aloud. We listened for what was memorable. That's something else that's important in poetry. If you're having, if you're a writer and you're having, you know, if you're, I think, you should be able to remember the most important parts of the poem, and that's part of how one rewrites. So yes, I, was, I had some of these poems from my thesis. I, I needed to write more, and I needed the time to do it. So, you know, it was disorienting. Actually, being in Eugene is similar. I was thinking about that recently. Um, it's, of course, I'm busy. You know, I have, I have plenty of, of teaching to do, but to disorient and to be in a new place. I found myself going to the coast 
um, right when I got here. I've been to Florence twice and up to Yahats, if I'm pronouncing it right. Mm -hmm. That's just the most breathtaking. It's, it's as breathtaking as places I have written about and been lucky enough to visit in Japan and Costa Rica. Yes, <laughs> the Oregon coast. No, I'm not kidding. I uh, just don't have to convince yeah. me. I'm fully aware. <laughs> Um, you've, you've already spoken about your teachers when you were there, but you're, you are a teacher. Yes. And you're here teaching, among other things. Say a little bit about how you approach teaching poetry. How do you go about doing that? With, so the MFA students have something they're already, um, they're, they're working towards a thesis. So it's teaching MFA students, it's different from teaching undergraduate students. I was mentioning to you my undergrads, come from all sorts of majors, only, really only I think a third of them are English majors. So I bring, I only bring poems that I love. I always make sure we bring and read poems aloud in the beginning. This is poetry writing that I'm teaching. So students submit the poems in advance. We hear them in one, in their own voice, and then we hear them in another student's voice. And I like to ask first, especially with first year groups, what's remarkable about this poem. Something is remarkable, the fact that anything gets written down at all. I like to begin with praise. Um, Columbia used to have a reputation before I got there of being you know, just knives, knives everywhere. Um, since I came from Marie Howe, I didn't have that background. It was more find something to praise and then do the Richard Howard thing and the, you know, <laughs> break out the knife. Because people want the poems to be better. Um, but I. I I think I was shy and I was intimidated when I started and I think I especially want to create a sense of trust. I mean, people are bringing in poems with all sorts of subject matter um, and we have to be respectful in the workshop. So the poetry collection was published four years prior to your memoir, The Book of Atlantis Black. And the poems in the memoir often treat the same events in your life and your, the lives of your family. Why, why did you need to return to those subjects in the form of the memoir? Oh, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, it wasn't finished, you know. It's, so yes, I created characters in this volume of poetry of my mother, of my sister, of my father, as you mentioned. And there was more. And for one thing, though, more things happened. Um, so the memoir focuses on four months in 2008. Um, and we know memoir is different from autobiography. Autobiography covering the span of a life, memoir really focusing. I mean, I had to include childhood and background, of course. Um, but those, you know, I was haunted. I, when I would try to write new poems, I found myself going back to certain scenes, some of which I wasn't even there for, mm -hmm. um, but that haunted me from those months. So I kind of, discovered I was writing memoir and then decided, well, I have to finish it, you know? <laughs> and it's not, it's, it was a years long process. So who was Atlantis Black? <sighs> Atlantis Black was my sister, Eunice Ann Bonner. I knew her as Nancy, but then I knew her as Atlantis. She became Atlantis, I guess when she was 17, uh, so I was 15, but I, there were a few years where I still sort of called her Nancy. Um, but by the time we were both living in New York City together in apartments, she was Atlantis. It was sort of like Nancy was childhood. She was a musician. She wrote songs and she performed them in New York. She took herself seriously for a while. She struggled with mental illness. I don't think we know exactly what um, her, I don't think she was ever fully diagnosed or mm -hmm. properly diagnosed. Mm -hmm. Um, we know she struggled with anxiety and depression. Those were some of the fodder that, that was, you know, she wrote songs about that. She, I guess, identified herself as a depressed girl who can't sing and doesn't give a fuck on her website. Um, and that's who she was to me. She was inspiring to me and then she devastated me. Um, she was suicidal. Uh, from the age of 13 at least. And um, there were, so there were several attempts. And then while I was in Greece, it was clear that her life was 
absolutely going out of control, and there was someone who entered her life who none of her friends or family knew, and who seemed um, to really have it out for her to uh, encourage her to die. So, you know, she was vulnerable. She was also very strong, um, and I admired her. She, for those who are watching the interview, you can listen to her music, it's on Spotify, okay. and she has a YouTube channel as well, which you maintain, which has videos our, of her and... Our friend, Tim Adams, who is a musician and who is just lovely, maintains everything. There's a Facebook page that he's in charge of. I think, so some of these things have gone out of our control sometimes, but Tim and I definitely chose to put the songs on Spotify, and we even finished her second album, it was on, it was like some of the songs have been produced, uh, but Steve Lyon, who produced The Cure and Susie and the Banshees, um, he was so kind. We just reached out to him. I had the memoir that was going to come out, and we thought, you know, this would be a really lovely thing to do um, for my sister. You know, because it's all, you also feel a little bit, you know, you have to be careful, you know. You're using someone's voice. I used a lot of material from her emails, from her Facebook, and yeah, I did that. I did that for her, um, and I think to yeah. Well, I had to do something with it, <laughs> right? So yeah, you can find it. I think Spotify is probably the best place, but that Facebook page is still in our control, to my knowledge. I don't know who's in charge of YouTube. So. Um I've described the text, you've described the text as a memoir, but formally speaking, that's an inadequate description. It's a kind of, it's really rich, it's a kind of generic hybrid, so it's kind of a detective story. Oh, yeah. And it's, there's passages that are very lyrical, and there's also passages where you're quoting from her emails to you, from her Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. So say a little bit about that quite unique form of the, of the memoir. Thank you. Yes, so it's something of a collage. I actually think it's connected to poetry mm -hmm. in how it's structured. So my approach to writing it, you know, I first I just I was writing by hand. I organized things into chapters. And when I knew I wanted to include her voice and to make this separate kind of narrative happen, the way Tin House published it, you can see sort of these black pages. And I wasn't sure if I would love it. I actually do love it. Um, but you can, you can read a whole separate narrative um, by looking at those sort of Atlantis passages. Um, and that's connected to poetry just in the way you put, put two unlike things together, you know, and make a third thing. Um, so the, yeah, the process, you know, in, in terms of figuring out where it began, it took me a while, but I knew it's not going to start, you know, in the autobiographical way. And technically, it, it's like, it's who knows? It's sort of, on the one hand, it begins with her words, and on the other hand, it begins with her death, in my words. Uh, and then there are, of course, the reports and other um, autopsy, you know, so sort of legal uh, paper trail. And it's a, it is a detective fiction or a detective t narrative as well. I mean, um, all through the reading of it, you, as you're telling your story and your readers, like, what really happened? Yeah. Oh, yeah. What really happened? And um, unlike a detective novel, the answer <laughs> is never finally <laughs> arrived at. It's, um, it keeps, I mean, it's incredible how more and more mysteries unfold as you go. You want to say something about that quality to it? I mean. Yeah, I like books that are unresolved. <laughs> um, not everybody does. And it was an interesting process finding the right agent, to find the right editor. I know I found the right, both of those people. So Maisie Cochran at Tin House was hugely helpful. And the first thing she did, she called me and she was like, you know, I, I know I don't need to say I'm sorry, but I'm sorry. <laughs> and she made me feel so much trust um, in editorial decisions. So. Yeah, it it's, has a little bit of mystery. Um, there was no way I could resolve something that didn't have resolution. So I, you know, it's a, it was a challenge to try to make sure 
the reader wouldn't just you know throw the book across the room out of rage you know but I want to know what you know um, some agents and editors uh, really wanted me to create resolution oh interesting mm -hmm. but um, that wasn't my project and that short of a confession there's not going to be resolution right. um, that's what I believe not yeah. in not in this sure. lifetime sure well I mean it, it, I find it no less compelling in fact I Thank found you. it more compelling because it didn't have that resolution Thank so you. one of the parts of your sister's life is that she spent time in prison but you you have also taught in the Penn prison writers program yeah. So tell us about the Penn Prison Writers Program. Sure. Well, for me, that was all correspondence. Um, so for four years, there was an African-American man in his 40s. Um, his story, he wrote both. He, actually, he wrote three different. He wrote poetry, memoir, and plays. Um, and he got moved between different facilities. I would send him books, and some of them didn't go through. You know, awful. Uh, but as a teacher with, you know, just big packets of things, those would usually get through. Um, and it's, it's actually, it's on my mind that the last couple of letters that I sent didn't, didn't, I didn't hear back. Um, he wrote this gorgeous memoir. He, it's not published. I hope that someone will publish it someday. Um, but it seemed that when he was in Philadelphia, he was at the wrong place at the wrong time. Um, and yeah, the Innocence Project was um, working on his case. Perhaps they still are. I hope they are. But yeah, it was, it was a very moving um, experience. I've only had him. So for four years, I had him. I haven't been in, you know, I haven't been a teacher in the mm -hmm. prison, as some people who do that mm -hmm. have been. So you are a visiting assistant professor at the University of Oregon. What attracted you here? Oh my goodness. I, well, I've been coming to Oregon. I have two good friends in Portland, poets, both poets I've met in different workshops. One at Columbia, one at the New York State Summer Institute. Henri Cole was my teacher there. Um, so they both live in Portland and have young families. And I stopped traveling you know, during the pandemic. Um, and I was, and I was only teaching on Zoom. And that, you know, that was like a lifeline too. It was adult ed, memoir writing, and I had a core group. It was always 10, but a core group of six um, coming back. Some of them had 80th birthdays, and some, you know, they had careers, you know, architect, um, homemaker, you know, but they had these stories to tell. and. Uh, anyway, I was teaching on Zoom, and I really wanted to be back in person. I still teach at the 92Y, and that, you know, I like Zoom for that. But yeah, Oregon was one reason, um, and in person is the other. So, um, what are you working on now? A couple of things. I have another poetry collection in progress. Um, some of the poems actually date from this time, but they, they wouldn't fit into this book. I have some new poems. Um, I was working on a crown of sonnets. Mm. I have a novel that I've been coming to and going to for some I brought it with me. I have it. Um, I think that that's a challenging form. It's a form I'd like to challenge myself with, um, but it's not finished. So I'd say both of those, and I can't work on both at the same time, so it's one or the other been more into the poetry since I'm in the poetry right now. Um, but yeah, I hope to finish a novel someday. So you are, obviously you are a writer who writes in different genres. I mean, yeah. you write poetry, you write memoir, and you say you write a, a novel. You say novel's a difficult form. Why? What's I, difficult for well, you? You know, maybe you would know better than I. Um, there's something about it. Basically what I'm saying is I don't feel that I have to write another memoir. I'm interested mm -hmm. in the essay form. Mm -hmm. Well, and knock and wood about that too. Maybe I will have to write another memoir. But I think of that as specific to the experiences, you know, um, like that, me that story had to be in the memoir form. Mm -hmm. Why is a novel so difficult? Ask one of your, ask one of your <laughs> novelist guests. Um, but I read a lot of novels. I admire uh, novels. And there were some, 
um, there was a book called Sister by Rosamond Lupton. It's a novel, but I, I remember reading that early on in my memoir writing process and thinking, you know, hers easily could have just been a memoir, but she had, you know, she had to fictionalize it. Um, but I do, I do read mysteries and that kind of, I like that genre. So um, we're coming to the end of the interview. I'll just have a couple of questions for you, but who are some of the writers who've influenced you? You've mentioned some of your teachers. Are there other writers that have been impactful for you? There are so many. Um, let's see, for the memoir, Mary Carr was a huge inspiration. Nick Flynn, so poets who wrote memoirs. Mm -hmm. um, Lacey Johnson, who had the same editor, Maisie Cochran, I thought her, the other side, um, was riveting and page-turning in that way that I wanted mine to be. Uh, too many to name. Natalie Diaz is a poet I love, and I've been teaching her work. Have you met her? Not a, we have not met her, but we did her in our poetry group fairly recently. <sighs> did you read Postcolonial Love Poem? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> need, need we say more? Um, too, too, too many. Uh, my partner, David Gates, writes novels, um, also stories, so he's an influence. Mary Gateskill, Amy Hempel, all of those, all of those fiction writers, a lot of whom I've met, again, through Bennington. Um, but, you know, so probably poets and novelist most of all. So my last question, um, can you recommend something for our viewers that you would urge them to read? Oh, since I just said my Natalie Diaz. <laughs> um, how about Eduardo C. Corral's Slow Lightning? I brought in um, one of his self-portraits to my undergrads and they were like, it rocked them and I could see the influences. So yeah, Slow Lightning, I think it won the Yale Younger, maybe five or seven or ten years ago. But Ocean Vuong taught me that book. So I used to be in a position where I could invite um, masters to come and teach. So Greg Pardlow, I, again, I tapped the Bennington community because why not? Um, and Ocean, you know, has that way of delivering a lecture. I mean, I think. Ocean is one of the, you know, isn't one of the most 25 influential people in the whole world. Um, but we all got that book communicated to us. So read Slow Lightning. Have you read it? Yeah. Oh, well, we were asking for the viewers or for you. No. You've for, read everything. For everybody. No, I haven't. Betsy Bonner, thank you so much for talking to us. It's been a pleasure. And thank you for being here at the University of Oregon. Thanks for having me. I'm thrilled to be here. I've been speaking with writer Betsy Bonner. She's a visiting assistant professor in the creative writing program at the University of Oregon. And on November 2nd, 2022, she gave a reading as part of the UO's creative writing program's reading series. Thanks so much for watching. <laughs>